Great. Well, thank you very much for that introduction, uh, Mark, and for the invitation to speak here today. Uh, thanks to uh, all of you for attending. I look forward to uh, chatting with you about uh, my subject today, which is ethics and uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, so I'm a, a Christian. I was raised uh, Methodist. Um, when my wife and I uh, got married, we were living in Georgetown, and uh, you know what, what church to attend was uh, such an important decision that I, I, I left it to her. Uh, she's the, the boss in the family and uh, looked around, and she really liked uh, Christ Church uh, in Georgetown. So uh, we're members there. Both of my uh, children were uh, baptized there, and uh, we enjoy the community. Um, uh, it turns out it's uh, also a church uh, with many other national security uh, leaders in town, which I uh, didn't realize. Um, and, and so this gets to the second part of my uh, life, which is my uh, work and my area of expertise, and uh, have focused a lot on nuclear weapons, nuclear strategy uh, over the years. So I've written um, seven books. Five of them are about nuclear weapons. Uh, I've worked in the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense and in the intelligence community uh, in various roles, including on nuclear weapons issues, uh, including uh, from 2017 to 2021, I was a special advisor uh, a special government employee and senior policy advisor in the Nuclear and Missile Defense Office uh, in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. So it was a part-time role. Uh, I was teaching at Georgetown, working at the Atlantic Council think tank, but also advising uh, in the Department of Defense and, and played a, a major role in uh, uh, drafting the 2018 uh, U.S. Nuclear Posture Review. Uh, so essentially the nuclear strategy uh, uh, still of the United States uh, the Biden team is doing uh, uh, their own nuclear posture review uh, currently. Uh, so I had these two parts of my life that I hadn't really uh, put together very often, but in uh, recent years, in part due to invitations from Mark and Providence, I, I have thought about how do these two parts of my life uh, fit together, uh, my Christianity and uh, nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence. And, and I think there is a widespread uh, view that um, nuclear weapons are immoral. Uh, th these are terrible uh, weapons. Uh, we saw at Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki, a single weapon you know, can kill um, many people. Uh, the uh, many um, Christian uh, churches now are seeming to come to that view that the threat of uh, annihilation is immoral, uh, and therefore we need to um, abolish nuclear weapons. Uh, but but I guess I see it uh, differently, and in, in fact, uh, the way I, I see it, I think U.S. nuclear weapons have been uh, one of the major forces for good uh, in the world um, over the past 70 years. And, and I said U.S. nuclear weapons specifically, because uh, I don't think Russian, Chinese, uh, North Korean nuclear weapons play the same role, but I do think that U.S. nuclear weapons uh, are special. Uh, and so you may have heard of this idea of a U.S.-led, rules-based international order that the United States and its allies uh, set up uh, after World War II. You know, during the Trump years, it was one of the criticisms uh, Biden and others made is that uh, you know Trump is going back on on this rules-based order, uh, and it's brought about uh, peace and, and prosperity and freedom. Uh, and, and I do think this U.S.-led rules-based order is is special, and I think that U.S. nuclear weapons are really a central pillar uh, to this order. Uh, and that without U.S. nuclear weapons, I'm not sure uh, we could have uh, had the the peace, prosperity, and freedom we've had over the past um, 70 years. Um, so, so why do I say that? Well, I think U.S. nuclear weapons are special for a couple of reasons. Um, one, U.S. nuclear strategy is different from the nuclear strategies of every other country on Earth uh, because the United States doesn't use its nuclear weapons just to uh, defend itself. That's what Russia, India, uh, China do. Uh, but the United States uses nuclear weapons to defend the entire free world. Uh, the United States extends uh, its nuclear umbrella over 30 formal treaty allies. So the 29 other members of NATO, Japan, South Korea, Australia, arguably other countries uh, rely on U.S. nuclear weapons uh, for their security. Uh, and we've essentially made a deal with them. We've said, don't build your own nuclear weapons. Uh, we think it would be dangerous if all 30 of you uh, all possess nuclear weapons. Uh, rather, don't build nuclear weapons, and you can rely on U.S. nuclear weapons uh, for your security. And so I think uh, through extended deterrence, uh, the United States uh, has played a great role in actually preventing the spread of nuclear weapons to other countries. I think without this policy of extended deterrence, it's very likely that Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Germany, Poland, uh, perhaps other countries uh, would have nuclear weapons today. Um, in, in addition, U.S. nuclear weapons and extended deterrence uh, contributed to peace and stability, especially in Europe and Asia, where we have those extended nuclear deterrence guarantees. 
Uh, you know, if you look back through history, uh, Europe was the site of, of major warfare uh, since the beginning of recorded human history up until 1945. Uh, and then since 1945, no major power wars in Europe, um, uh, no uh, major power wars in, in Asia. Uh, and I think it was that U.S. nuclear umbrella that extended deterrence that deterred Russia, deterred uh, China, deterred uh, North Korea, uh, and contributed uh, to peace. Uh, because of that, the peace pro provided by U.S. nuclear weapons, uh, Europe and, and East Asia uh, became some of the most prosperous and free uh, parts uh, of the world. Um, you know, we, we often forget this, but before 1945, there were only a handful of democracies in Europe. Uh, today, you know, uh, 30 or so democracies in Europe. Uh, before 1945, zero democracies in Asia. Uh, now Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, other um, countries defended by U.S. nuclear weapons uh, evolved and developed these free uh, institutions. So I, I think essentially U.S. nuclear weapons served as this fence that allowed these gardens of, of peace, prosperity, uh, and freedom to uh, flourish. Uh, the other thing that's unique about U.S. nuclear weapons is counterforce targeting. Uh, so, you know, often when people think about nuclear deterrence, often the way it's taught in uh, universities is essentially this idea that, you know, the United States has a lot of nuclear weapons. We threaten to slaughter a bunch of people in Moscow and Beijing. Uh, they have a lot of nuclear weapons. They threaten to slaughter a lot of people in Washington, Los Angeles, uh, Paris and London, and, and everyone's deterred. Uh, and, and that's how nuclear deterrence works. Uh, but that's actually not how U.S. nuclear strategy works uh, and hasn't been for a long time. Instead, the United States practices so-called counter-force uh, nuclear targeting, uh, which means that the United States does not purposely target uh, innocent civilians. Um, rather, U.S. Uh, nuclear targeting practices are consistent with international law uh, and uh, uh, consistent with just war theory. Uh, so the United States uh, only targets legitimate military uh, targets, even with its nuclear weapons. Uh, so we don't purposely try to slaughter a lot of people in Moscow and Beijing. Uh, instead, we target uh, missile silos, air bases, naval bases, command and control sites, uh, leadership sites. Now, um, some of these are located uh, in cities, and you know, we are talking about uh, nuclear attacks, so there would be uh, a, a lot of death and destruction. I'm not downplaying that. But I think there is an, an ethical and a practical distinction between purposely trying to, to slaughter innocent civilians uh, and trying to uh, target only legitimate military targets. Uh, and, and indeed, that's you know, one of the principles that just war theory uh, is based on. Uh, and, and the United States is explicit about this. You can look to the 2013 nuclear employment guidance that President Obama gave to the Department of Defense, uh, saying that we practice counterforce targeting uh, in part for these ethical and um, legal reasons. Now, when you're doing a counterforce targeting, that requires a, a larger force. Uh, if all we wanted to do was kill a bunch of people in Russia and, and uh, China, you know, maybe one or two nuclear weapons would be enough. You know, certainly 200 would be enough. Uh, but if you're conducting counterforce targeting, going after air bases, missile silos, uh, et cetera, that's more targets, uh, requires more uh, warheads. Uh, so some people say, well, okay, I understand the need for nuclear deterrence, but why does the United States need 1,550 nuclear weapons, the current size of the nuclear arsenal? Uh, couldn't we have fewer? Uh, and the main reason is counterforce uh, targeting. Uh, in fact, in my 2018 book, uh, in an unclassified way, I just counted up the uh, targets, uh, nuclear and strategic targets in Russia, China, and North Korea, uh, and um, uh, made some assumptions about U.S. targeting practices, how many U.S. warheads would that require? And I, I got to about 2,000, you know, which is roughly the size of the U.S. Uh, nuclear arsenal today. Uh, the other thing just war theory um, emphasizes, international law emphasizes, is, is that self-defense uh, is, is a legitimate uh, reason uh, to use military force. And, and I do think that the United States and its allies use nuclear weapons and nuclear deterrence uh, in self-defense. Uh, so I, I talked about this rules-based uh, system we've built over the past 70 years. Uh, and it's not a perfect uh, system, but if you compare it to any other uh, system in world history, uh, the results have been pretty good. Uh, zero great power wars in uh, 75 years. Uh, from the 1600s to 1945, 1% to 2% of the world's population uh, died in armed conflict. Uh, today that number is uh, a fraction of uh, 1%. 
Uh, so the world is much more peaceful uh, today than at any point before 1945. Uh, the world is much more prosperous today than at any point since 1945. Uh, 1945, uh, poverty rate, about 66% of the Earth's population lived in poverty. Today it's 10%, uh, so still too high, but um, you know, much, many fewer people living in poverty than the past. Uh, standards of living have uh, multiplied several times since 1945. And, and I also, uh, also mentioned uh, the, the freedom of uh, 15 or so democratic countries in the world in 1945. Uh, today around uh, 100. So the world is much more peaceful, uh, prosperous, and free uh, today than it was in the past. And again, I think U.S. leadership and nuclear weapons have been an important part of that. Uh, so it's been good for the world, good for the United States, although our enemies uh, don't like it very much. Uh, Russia, China uh, in particular are, are revisionist powers that want to uh, tear this system down. Uh, President Putin has said explicitly that he wants uh, new rules or no rules. Uh, so he doesn't like this rules-based system. And he, uh, Russia and China are building up their nuclear uh, capabilities to challenge this system. So you've probably seen uh, the recent news, China building hundreds of new uh, nuclear silos in western desert, deserts, testing new nuclear-capable hypersonic missiles. Uh, the Department of Defense has estimated that the size of China's nuclear arsenal could quadruple uh, in, the, um, uh, in the next decade. They're building new nuclear submarines, new nuclear bombers, the list goes on and on, new missile defenses. Uh, Russia is investing in uh, exotic nuclear weapon systems, uh, nuclear-powered um, uh, submarine drones. Uh, the idea is that they could pull up in, say, the port of Baltimore and, and detonate, uh, building a nuclear-powered uh, nuclear cruise missile, so a cruise missile with a nuclear warhead on the tip, but also a mini nuclear reactor inside to power it, giving it essentially unlimited uh, range. Uh, and Russia has uh, a large stockpile of non-strategic nuclear weapons. Uh, basically, any weapon system you can imagine, uh, Russia has put a nuclear warhead on it. So they have nuclear torpedoes, nuclear depth charges, nuclear naval mines, uh, nuclear landmines, nuclear surface-to-surface -surface missiles, nuclear surface-to-air missiles to shoot airplanes out of the sky, uh, nuclear-tipped missile defenses to um, uh, shoot missiles um, out of the sky. And, and this is backing this uh, revisionist um, strategy. I think uh, Russia and China have been very clear. They want uh, the United States to go home, to disband these uh, alliances, to give them spheres of influence in uh, Europe and Asia. Uh, and so uh, given that threat, I, I think it makes sense that the United States and its allies in the free world uh, have a strong nuclear deterrent for self-defense consistent with uh, just war theory. Uh, if we don't have a strong deterrent, then Russia and China will use uh, these nuclear weapons as a backstop uh, for aggression. Uh, and I do think that that's one of the main motivators of China's nuclear buildup, uh, that uh, they think that if they can uh, deter the United States with nuclear weapons, it will give them a freer hand to engage in aggression against Taiwan uh, and other neighbors. Um, so, um, in short, I see uh, U.S. nuclear weapons as um, ethical and, and consistent with uh, just war theory, with international law, uh, and again, as one of the greatest uh, forces uh, for good in the world underpinning this rules-based international system. Um, so what, what does that mean then for the future of U.S. nuclear policy? Does it mean that the United States always needs to maintain uh, a robust nuclear arsenal? Uh, and I would say no, there are always uh, choices. I, I think the United States could greatly reduce the size of its nuclear arsenal. Uh, it could even uh, disarm if it wanted to, uh, but that would be putting a lot at risk. It would mean throwing away uh, this world that we've built over the past 70 years. I think it would mean um, pulling back these extended deterrence commitments, basically saying to our 30 allies, go ahead and build nuclear weapons, you're on your own, uh, we're not protecting you anymore. Uh, it would mean throwing international law and just war theory out the window. Uh, we're only going to have a few nuclear weapons to incinerate cities. Uh, we're not going to do counterforce targeting. So you could go in that direction. I think it would be a mistake. Uh, on the other hand, if the United States wants to continue to play uh, this important role that it's played since World War II, uh, providing peace and stability in important geopolitical regions, uh, defending allies, um, complying with international law and just war theory, uh, then I do think the United States will continue to require a robust nuclear arsenal. So I'll end my talk there and very much look forward to your questions and comments. Yes, please. 
Thank you so much for coming out here to talk to us. I'm Rohan from Wheaton College. Um, you talked about how after 1945, when the U.S. Uh, launched the nuclear umbrella, how that helped reduce poverty. Could you tell us more about how that happened and kind of just walk us through the history of how that action that the U.S. took actually helped reduce world poverty? Oh, yeah. So the question is, how do uh, U.S. nuclear weapons relate to world poverty? And, and good question. I skipped over a lot, you know, 75 years of history in, in 13 uh, minutes there. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm a political scientist, I'm not an economist, but one, one of the things economists uh, have shown is that uh, countries that deal with uh, uh, in conflict you know, uh, don't develop as quickly as countries uh, in peace, and it makes sense if you're uh, f uh, fighting wars, you don't have the kind of peace and stability that leads to stable uh, economic environment that allows for uh, long-term growth. Uh, and so um, U.S. nuclear weapons have provided uh, that, that uh, peace uh, that has allowed um, countries to develop. Uh, and so you know, a good example of this, I think, is, um, uh, uh, and it's not just U.S. nuclear weapons, it's this broader uh, rules-based order, but you can lo look at um, Eastern Europe and um, you know, the, the growth um, after uh, World War II, once they joined this uh, Western alliance, were under the U.S. Um, nuclear umbrella, joined NATO, joined the EU, uh, in uh, remarkable uh, economic development um, there. You know, the other piece of this is that U.S. allies uh, don't have to spend as large a part of their economy on defense uh, because they are uh, relying on, on U.S. nuclear weapons as part of their defense that allows them to invest in um, health care and, and other things. Now, this has often been a source of tension in, in U.S. foreign policy. You know, Trump loudly complained that allies needed to spend more uh, on their defense. Uh, but it wasn't just Trump. Uh, you can actually go all the way back to uh, Eisenhower and, and see other American presidents asking you know, the Europeans to do more for their defense. And, and I think that's right. I think uh, Europeans um, uh, uh, should do more. Uh, I think some of our Asian allies, including Taiwan, should do more to invest in, in their own defense. Uh, but I think the fact of the matter is the fact, uh, since they haven't had to invest so much in defense, they've been able to invest more in, uh, in uh, their societies and, and economic development. Hi, my name is Natalie. Thank, first of all, thanks for coming and speaking with us. Um, but my first question is that some people argue that increased proliferation could be a positive thing based on theories of mutually assured destruction. Where do you think middle powers lie in extended U.S. nuclear deterrence? Yeah, it's a, a good question. So some of you may be uh, familiar with this, this proliferation optimism debate that the question references. So there are some um, international relations scholars. Kenneth Waltz is a prominent international relations scholar uh, who said actually the, the spread of nuclear weapons is a good thing because nuclear weapons deter war. Uh, and uh, if every country had nuclear weapons, uh, every country would be afraid of every other country and, and we'd have um, world peace. And in fact, one of the last um, articles that Waltz uh, wrote, he's uh, no longer with us, but uh, before uh, he, he passed away, he wrote an article in Foreign Affairs arguing that Iran should get nuclear weapons, and, and that would be a good thing. You know, Iran would deter us, we'd deter Iran, Iran would deter Israel, Israel would deter Iran, and, and we'd have uh, peace. Um, so I think that argument's uh, mistaken for a couple of reasons. Um, one, I, I do think it, it's not just the technology, it's, it's who possesses it and, and what, are they, what are they wanting to do with it. And I think the United States uh, has used its nuclear weapons to uh, you know, defend uh, the free world uh, and, and build the world that we've had for the past 75 years. I don't think that's how Iran, Russia, North Korea, and others uh, think about using their nuclear weapons. And, and, and we have you know, data uh, of how North Korea uses its nuclear weapons. I think it's used it as a backstop for more aggression um, against South Korea since acquiring nuclear weapons has sunk a South Korean warship, shelled a South Korean island. Um, has um, used, uh, unlike the United States, using its nuclear weapons to stop the spread of nuclear weapons. North Korea has uh, tried to proliferate nuclear weapons, uh, played a major role in um, helping uh, Pakistan uh, develop, uh, develop its missile capability, uh, helped Syria build a nuclear reactor that uh, Israel bombed. Um, so if, if every country had nuclear weapons, I don't think they'd be as responsible as the United States. I think they would use them as a backstop for aggression, uh, for proliferation, uh, and other dangers. Uh, the, the other problem is that I, I think there's a, a logical contradiction uh, in Waltz's argument. 
be, because I do think that there are there are risks with uh, nuclear weapons. I mean, as long as nuclear weapons exist, uh, there is a risk uh, that they could be used. It's not, you know, uh, the, I don't think it's it's high, but it's not zero. Uh, and so, in fact, that's the only reason nuclear deterrence works. You know, if if our adversaries thought there was zero chance that the United States would ever use nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, their deterrence wouldn't work. They'd say this is a bluff, uh, but that means there is a risk these things could be used. Um, so if you give every country nuclear weapons, you know, th those risks, I think, uh, greatly increase. And so I think traditional U.S. nonproliferation policy, maintaining this capability for ourselves, uh, but trying to prevent it both to friends and to uh, enemies uh, is, is the right approach. And then I guess just a brief uh, follow-up. Given the buildup of Chinese military and nuclear capabilities, how likely do you think it would be that countries like Japan, who rely on the U.S. nuclear umbrella, might see their situation as more insecure and maybe would proliferate themselves? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So um, the United States has extended deterrence, tried to convince our adversaries not to build nuclear weapons, uh, but we haven't been um, you know, uh, completely successful in that regard. Uh, both Britain and France during the Cold War uh, decided that they wanted to build uh, independent nuclear arsenals. Um, Israel, uh, despite uh, the Kennedy administration trying to persuade, persuade them not to build nuclear weapons, uh, Israel decided to build its own uh, nuclear arsenal. Um, so far, the record has been better in Asia, but um, there is the possibility that Japan or South Korea or maybe in the future other countries could decide that they need uh, their own nuclear weapons uh, for their security. Um, South Korea uh, did have a, uh, an illegal nuclear program in the 1970s. Taiwan had a program in the 1970s. Uh, the United States encouraged them to shut those programs down. Uh, we essentially said choose uh, between uh, the security guarantee from the United States or these nuclear facilities, and they chose um, the United States. Um, uh, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan probably all have the industrial capacity necessary to build nuclear weapons on short order uh, if they needed to, so the only question really is demand. Uh, now, in my uh, role as a, uh, uh, you know, in Washington, I often have dialogues with uh, experts and officials from other countries. So I've talked to South Korean and Japanese officials about this uh, exact question. And, and what they say is, um, as long as the U.S. nuclear guarantee is good, uh, that we won't build um, independent uh, arsenals. Um, but the pressure, especially in South Korea, is growing uh, as North Korea builds up its forces. Uh, and in fact, some public opinion polls in South Korea today show that a majority of South Koreans support South Korea building uh, its own nuclear uh, arsenal. Now, like a lot of public opinion polls, it depends on how it's framed. If you add a clause in there that says, uh, would you want to build nuclear weapons, even if you know China and the United States would be very upset, you know, those numbers drop down. Um, but, um, and, and you do have some prominent South Korean politicians also calling for South Korea uh, to build its own nuclear arsenal. Uh, and so, uh, getting directly to your question, you know, as the United States becomes more vulnerable to Chinese nuclear weapons a as they build up their uh, forces, I, I do think that questions will be raised in Tokyo and Seoul. Our job of reassuring them uh, is going to be harder. Uh, I, I think we can succeed, but, you know, we didn't always succeed during uh, the Cold War. Again, Britain and France and Israel decided, no, we need our own nuclear weapons. Uh, so it's possible those countries could go down that path, but I think uh, for now, uh, it's still in the U.S. interest to extend deterrence and, and persuade them not to build uh, independent arsenals. Uh, Nate Waite, Liberty University. Uh, I had a quick question because you were talking about uh -huh. counterforce targeting being our strategy instead of mutually assured destruction. But with Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they also were military targets nominally, but the reason why Japan broke will was broken to fight was because of intense uh, devastation, I would argue. So how do you see that playing in with our strategy as compared to breaking the enemy's will to fight with Russia and China because there will be inevitably be a lot of civilian casualties? Yes, and um, I, I said the United States has never done counter-value uh, targeting, but you know, I think Hiroshima and Nagasaki are at least um, debatable. But the, the first uh, president to come out who was very clear on this, uh, uh, believe it or not, was um, Jimmy Carter. And his Secretary of Defense, um, Harold Brown, uh, testified before Congress about uh, counterforce targeting, the importance of counterforce targeting. Uh, he said, we, we've always considered it important to target the forces uh, that could do damage to us and our allies. 
and that's been uh, continued by every uh, president uh, since then. Uh, and so uh, a couple of things I would say. One, we do counter force targeting in part for ethical reasons, uh, but, but there is an important strategic reason as well. Uh, you know, the, the enemy gets a vote. Uh, we don't want a nuclear war, but if, if Russia, China, or North Korea decide to launch a nuclear attack this afternoon, you know, the United States, isn't, uh, President Biden, isn't going to say, okay, now we must sit back and accept our, our mutually assured destruction. Uh, no, we're going to try to do everything we can to defend ourselves, defend our allies. And so that's where counterforce targeting uh, matters for strategic reasons. You know, every enemy nuclear weapon we can destroy on a missile base, uh, air base, naval base over there is a nuclear weapon that's not landing on Paris or, or Washington uh, or somewhere else. So that's the strategic um, logic behind uh, counterforce targeting. Um, in addition, um, you know, the essence of deterrence is holding at risk that which your adversary values. You know, in, in the West, in, in the United States, we value uh, human life. Uh, and so, uh, in fact, we, you know, refer to counter value targeting and, and targeting against people as, as synonymous. You know, obviously, that's what leaders would uh, care about. Although when you think about our authoritarian rivals, that, that's probably not uh, the case. In fact, Mao, Mao Zedong made some re really blood curdling statements during the Cold War. Um, there was a meeting he had with Khrushchev um, uh, where uh, Khrushchev was warning Mao to be more cautious around the United States. It could lead to a nuclear conflict. Uh, and Mao said, well, well, that's okay. If, even if there's a nuclear war that kills millions of Chinese, uh, we'll just make more Chinese. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I think that's part of the strategic reason as well. The United States doesn't do counter value targeting. We want to hold at risk what the enemy values. And for many dictators, what they value more than the, the lives of their people are their military forces, uh, their own lives, uh, their ability to command and control their military forces. Uh, and so uh, that's part of the strategic logic uh, as well. Uh, to the last point about um, collateral damage, you know, I, I completely um, agree. If we're talking about a nuclear exchange, especially a large-scale nuclear exchange, even with counterforce targeting, you know, there, there's going to be a lot of um, death and destruction. Uh, but again, a moral and, and practical distinction. I've done some of these nuclear exchange calculations. I have them in my 2018 uh, book. But you know the the differences are are substantial and can be counted in, in tens of millions of human lives, uh, depending on uh, U.S. strategy. And and so I think uh, I think those tens of millions of lives uh, matter. And and the United States should try to to limit damage uh, from a nuclear war as part of its strategy. All the way in the back. Hi, my name is Michael. I'm a graduate student at Harvard. I also study nuclear policy. Um, my question uh, is that it seems, as Christians, we have a responsibility, of course, to maintain an effective nuclear deterrent. Uh, but we also have a responsibility to a stable nuclear world order, uh, that is, you know, keeping controls in place uh, on, on nuclear production internationally. And it seems in the last couple of years as well that we've uh, seen a breakdown in those, unfortunately, the final death of the INF Treaty, and now, as you so rightly noted, the uh, Chinese rush to nuclear production. Uh, what do you see as the future, then, of nuclear diplomacy, of potential uh, negotiated nu uh, nuclear freezes or, or nuclear reduction? Uh, do, do we have any hope at all, or is deterrence our only option? Yeah, uh, good question. So the uh, question's about arms control. And, and I think there is basically a, a bipartisan uh, consensus on um, nuclear strategy. And it's basically strong deterrence. Uh, but also strong efforts at arms control. And when you're pursuing both of those things, uh, it's easier to get bipartisan consensus, e easier to get consensus from allies. Uh, and so arms control was an important part of US nuclear strategy with Russia, um, uh, in beginning in the 60s, 70s uh, with the Soviet Union. Uh, and that's an important part of damage limitation as well. You know, I talked about how we do counterforce targeting to limit damage. Um, but arms control uh, limits uh, damage. You know, one way to get rid of Russian nuclear weapons is to, to strike them uh, in, in a nuclear war. The other way is to talk to them and convince them uh, to get rid of them. So I think arms control uh, can be an effective uh, tool. Uh, you, you need uh, an adversary, though, that's willing to engage in, in arms control and willing to uh, abide by the agreements. And so that's the problem we've had in recent years. Um, so China has never uh, engaged in arms control. 
Uh, the uh, Bi- uh, Obama administration, the Trump administration tried to engage China. I suspect the Biden administration will as well. Uh, but uh, in the Trump administration, China was uneven, will, uh, to, un, uh, unwilling to even come to the talks. And so that makes it difficult. Um, Russia, we had arms control in the past, but President Putin in recent years has decided that that's no longer uh, in his interest. He, he cheated on several arms control agreements. Uh, and so now the only remaining agreement is this uh, new START treaty that limits both sides to 1,550 uh, nuclear weapons. And there are real questions about the future of that treaty, given uh, the Russian and the Chinese uh, buildups. Uh, so background for everybody who's not studying nuclear strategy at uh, Harvard, but uh, to get directly to your um, question, so I, I am I, I worried about the future of arms control. I think it is a valuable tool. I think we should pursue it. Uh, but I think it's going to be difficult if, if China won't even uh, discuss it. Uh, there are strategic stability dialogues now between the United States and Russia, um, but it's really hard for me to imagine uh, an agreement in, in the uh, coming years. And I think the only solution is a kind of asymmetric um, agreement. You know, we're most worried right now about some of the Russian non-strategic nuclear weapons you know, that aren't covered. They claim to be worried about our missile defenses and, and other things. So there may be some kind of innovative trades there where we're putting limits on missile defenses in exchange for limits on their non-strategic nuclear weapons. Um, Maybe uh, some kind of asymmetric deal is also possible with China, but um, uh, I think really hard to imagine a binding arms control agreement uh, in the next several years. Thank you. Thank you. Colleen Quinn from Masai University. So you talked about how American nuclear weapons have led to a rise in democracies across the globe. Yet we've seen many of these younger democracies kind of fall into states of turmoil and unrest. So I'm really curious how you justify more nuclear spending when we could be providing aid to sustain these democracies. Oh, um, so good question. The question of the price tag of um, nuclear weapons. Uh, And so this is another point. uh, to quote Obama's Secretary of Defense, Ash Car- Carter, uh, nuclear weapons don't cost that much. Um, so uh, uh, the United States um, spends about uh, 5% of its uh, defense budget on nuclear weapons. Um, so is that too much or, or too little? You know, reasonable people can disagree, um, but uh, every past uh, or every recent Secretary of Defense has said that nuclear weapons, uh, nuclear deterrence is the foremost priority uh, of the U.S. Department of Defense. Uh, And so 5% of the defense budget for the top priority, uh, to me, seems like a a good value, uh, actually. Um, And, um, you know, uh, providing, uh, so the question was, should we be providing uh, aid on democracy uh, promotion uh, instead? Uh, And and the United States does have um, uh, democracy promotion uh, programs, um, you know, going and training legislators in the developing world, how the U.S. Congress works to, to help them develop a more uh, robust democratic system, uh, other efforts as well. So, so I don't think it's um, either or. I think it uh, uh, can be both and. Thank you. 